Welcome to this edition of Let's Talk Forensic Psychology. We've, today we've got Samantha Walkden, um, who's a lecturer in forensic psychology at Leeds Trinity University. Um, she's passionate fundraiser for Macmillan Cancer Support, um, and she's also worked really hard to think about the stigma associated with people who've got mental illness and um, offend. Um, so we really welcome you today. We're really pleased to see you. Thank um, you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, could you tell us a bit about your journey into forensic psychology? Yeah, um, I'll give you the short version and then you can ask me any particular questions that you want to know more about. Um, basically, I, I wanted to be a, a teacher when I was younger and I was also um, an avid footballer. I kind of played for lots of different teams and things like that. So I was on a young footballer's kind of pathway and I did um, refereeing and football coaching. I thought that my teaching would go into more football, more sports side of things. And then when I went to college, um, I took sport, drama and theatre studies, religious studies and psychology because it was an extra, there was an extra option. So why not? That sounded fun. Um, and then completely kind of lost interest in the sports side of things. And my parents were a little bit worried about that. Um, and I just became really interested in, you know, why people act certain ways and then started to drift more to the forensic side in my second year of A-levels thinking about um, why people would commit offences, you know, what makes people bad if we want to, you know, use that term, we know that's really harmful, but the, the idea of are, are people born bad, do people become bad, is it an inherent trait, um, all those kind of factors that are associated with it, and then I became more interested in the aspects of mental illness. I then decided to do forensic psychology at university, and I was the first in my family to go to university, so again, my parents were a little bit shocked by the the really direct career change away from all the football things that I'd done. And then when I started to study forensic psychology more at university, I had the opportunity to do an internship, which was a research project that was about facial composite systems, the EvoFit system that was at the University of Central Lancashire. So I did that internship and that kind of opened my eyes a little bit to what it's like to do research um, not just to do the research, but the impact of research and working with participants and working also with the supervisor, how we develop ideas um, and the impact that can have in different areas of forensic psychology, for example, with the police, with eyewitness testimony in, in that example. Um, and then I had other priorities, obviously, Jerry mentioned before about Macmillan. My grandma became unwell in my second year of university. So I decided to take some time out to spend it with her after my degree, but unfortunately she passed away the day before my final exams. So I sat my exams and then I thought, uh, I need to spend some time kind of away from studying um, to spend some time on me, to grieve, but also to think about like, I don't wanna jump into a career that I'm not 100% sure of. And I'd recommend this to anyone watching who's in the final year thinking about whether they should go straight to a master's. And I thought, well, who can I work with? A, a client population, obviously at the time, patients, service users, different terminology that we use for them. So I went onto the BPS website and I kind of literally just go, you know, the, the search bar where it says find a forensic psychologist in your area. And it came up with someone who worked at um, a local low secure unit for adult males with complex mental health needs. I didn't even know this secure unit was near where I lived, but I'd found it through the BPS by looking um, for a psychologist in the area. Um, I then went there and spoke to this lead psychologist and did two weeks working on some mindfulness information and then thought, you know what, I really want to I really want to go in here and see whether I want to be a registered psychologist, work with people who have a history of offending and mental health issues and learn more about how this how, how they live and how this can impact them. And then that was that was like the, the, the solidifying kind of thing for me, for me to go into forensic psychology was working in that low security unit for two years. Um, I did all sorts of training. So the cuff personality disorder training, uh, we do RAID training, which is reinforced appropriate implode disruptive. Lots of different things I was able to be involved with, with the service users. And then I decided to do my master's in investigative psychology. And then from then did my PhD after that and then became an academic. So yeah, I mean, that was a short version, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really one of the biggest questions people ask us is how, you know, how do we get some volunteer work or how do we get some work into this route? And whether, and actually just, you know, hearing that you approached a psychologist and that you 
from that you managed to get some, I don't know if it was paid or unpaid, but it's one of the biggest questions, you know, how do we start getting some experience in this field? It was unpaid. Um, it was only for two weeks. The, there are a couple of pros and cons to this. And I always say to my students particularly, it is difficult. I'm from a working class background. A lot of my students are from working class first generation backgrounds. And I feel uncomfortable telling students that they need to get unpaid work experience because I understand that's not that's not feasible for everybody I was working at McDonald's full-time for four years throughout my degree and then at Frankie and Benny's I had lots of part-time jobs because I needed to to be able to fund being able to drive and books and things like that so if you can afford to do that then yes I would recommend it but if you can't I think being a healthcare worker in a secure unit and getting paid to do that mm. is is just as beneficial it's it's a similar role to what you would do if you were volunteering and um, a lot of places probably won't offer it to kind of first year or second year um psychology students because you'd need to get obviously a dbs check and you're not going to pay for it they're not going to pay for it for you to to go in and do it for free and um, but they'll do all that for you if you are a healthcare worker or if you do support work and things i also have some experience working in community and um, brain injury support work but i do have a lot of um videos that i make and we're going to talk about this in a second on social media um, and i have a lot of pinned videos where i show people how they can get work experience and the pros and cons yeah. of lots of different roles it's not just your first psychology role has to be an AP, has to be an assistant psych. It's not realistic for a lot of us, especially those of us from working class backgrounds. So why not get paid and start off as a healthcare worker? Mm -hmm. And you really get the most intense experience, I believe, having that rather than going in at a level of an AP and not working with those one-to-one -one and learning all the little the quirks and the 12-hour shifts. And, and that was so beneficial for me. And, and now in my teaching practice, I can implement all those things that I learned at that lower level rather than just going in at the, the trainee route. I, I know all those other little bits and those service user stories that I can share with my students as well. And hopefully you can tell how passionate I am about sharing service user stories because, you know, obviously I'm a, an expert in the field, but the real experts are the people that we work with who have this lived experience. And it's so important for, for me to share that with the students as well. Mm. And you interact really regularly on social media and use um, TikTok and different sort of formats. So what, where do you get such creative ideas? I mean, you, you're really sort of um, lots of followers and, and create and present things in a really easy way to follow. Um, how what made you sort of go into that field? Um, it was actually a joke between me and a friend. Um, I used to do some um, fitness influencing on Instagram uh, quite a while ago. And uh, my friend said to me during during the pandemic, kind of middle-ish, she said, oh, there's a lot of people on TikTok. And I wasn't really on it then. I thought, it's not for me. I don't really, I don't really get it. I don't know what it is. Uh, she said, there's a lot of people on here. There's a lot of misinformation about psychology. And she knew that that would, that would trigger me a little bit to spark me to go on there. You can't give me a challenge like that. And she said, there's a lot of misinformation, Sam. I think it'd be really good if you made some videos about like, no, this isn't right. You know, like, oh, psychology says if you dream this, it means this. We know it doesn't. So, you know, going on there and pulling those out and giving people more the research evidence and service user stories and my experience in, in psychology. So I said, oh, I don't really know. I'll have a look. And I had a look last July. Um, didn't really get it at the start and then got the hang of how to use the different features. And it's just that's that was it really, and the, here we are now. But yeah, I use, I use TikTok a lot because I think students and young people who are interested in psychology, you know, potential students, they want to know quickly, they want to be engaged, they want to have readily accessible information, don't we all? And I think if I can make that as interesting as possible to people, but accurate, so not just interesting to drag people in or to, you know, to clickbait them, so that people are genuinely interested in psychology and think, oh, it's not just kind of a load of people in lab coats that sit in a room, we don't really know what they're doing, it's a secret. Psychology shouldn't be a secret, it should be something that we're passionate about sharing as researchers, as academics, as practitioners. We should be shared with everybody on all different levels. So that was kind of my inspiration to start the channel. I've got different colleagues involved in things as well, talking about their research, because we've all got different career journeys. Um, trying to make the content accessible to people. So making sure that there's, there's captions, there's links to resources. Obviously this will be linked in a future video um, and change my approach to 
teaching, not just in the classroom, not just in my own pedagogy when I'm stood in front of a, a lecture, you know, a lectern, but to think about innovative ideas to get people engaged and to spark an interest because a lot of people we know become involved in psychology with their degrees, but what keeps them, what keeps them interested? We need to tell them about all the different areas that we have to offer um, and not let it go, not let it go dry. So hopefully someone sees me on social media, they've been thinking about psychology and they think, you know, oh, that's not a traditional route, you know, first generation working class, all these different ideas. Maybe, maybe that could be me, maybe I could do it. And if I could just inspire one person, not to be like me because they shouldn't want to be like me, but to be themselves and be inspired by something that I'm saying to create their own career, whether that be in, in forensic psychology or not, but to just get them interested in thinking about psychology um, and sharing that with a wider audience is, was really my motivation for it. And what's the response been then from your your peers, your um, your other lecturers, and also your students. Um, I'm smiling because it's interesting because it's like a, it's a bit of a joke in the team meetings sometimes. And um, like, what's Sam up to now? Who's getting involved in um, in the next TikTok? But yeah, a lot of my colleagues get involved um, from different areas of of psychology as well. Um, and the majority of them love it. We've I've made some with a, a colleague, Dr. Alison Torn, about how to. Um, look at feedback from assignments and how to get the most out of your feedback. I've done some with um, my colleague, Dr. Russ Woodfield about forensic psychology and about our different areas of forensic psychology and how we can get involved. Um, another colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Lisa Webster, we did one where it was um, a dancing trend video, but made it about our academic careers. So every time we did like another dance move, something would come up about like, you know, our undergraduate degree and then our master's degree and then our PhD. And a lot of people engaged with that and was like, oh, you know, I wasn't expecting to see this kind of content, but getting on a trend and spinning it to be about psychology, I think just makes, uh, I, hopefully people know that we are human and we're not just kind of sat in a room again, doing research, writing things up, boring. Um, you know, we can do what you do. We can make that interesting. Um, and that's why you should come over and do psychology. Um, but yeah, my colleagues have been really supportive. They really enjoy it. Um, and then my students, some of them will come up to me at the end of lectures and say things like, oh, I saw, put this the other day on TikTok. Could you make a TikTok about this? Um, I was eating lunch the other day and a student who wasn't a psychology student um, came over in the cafeteria and just kind of said that they'd seen some study tips videos and it was really helpful and that they had um, a learning difficulty and they wanted some more videos about how to read journal articles if you struggle to break down information. Um, and I'm always happy for people to approach me with new ideas. Don't be afraid to ask me um, and if I can create that content for you then I'm more than happy to because you know I will run out of ideas one day so please do suggest um, new ideas if students are watching this and they want to see something from me and um, I'd be more than happy to do that and then I've had some uh, wider engagement from UCAS and um, they asked me to get involved with a video for them which I did do and um, Microsoft um, 365 got commented on some of my videos as well, which was quite interesting about PowerPoint and how to create engaging PowerPoint slides. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm looking, I'm happy to, to kind of collaborate on a why not to plug myself, but I'm happy to collaborate with people. If anyone sees this and wants to get involved, um, it's not just about me, it's about making it um, engaging to other audiences. What you're saying is so important, whether you're in academia or whether you're a practitioner, I think what really stands you in good stead is when you can really find common ground with people. And whether or not that's working with people in prison, secure units, out in the community, whether it's working with students, people that perhaps have got offences, whatever it is, I think what you're saying is about engaging people in really thinking about psychology. What does it mean? How can it help people? Or, or, or how can it be difficult to work with? I suppose I think um, engagement is such a big part of being a psychologist, whether you're an academic psychologist or a practitioner psychologist. I mean, why for you though? Why academia and not practitioner? Or, or will this be a future thing for you? What's, what's been your decision? I mean, I'd never close the door to, to practice and things like that, but I think for me, coming from a background of wanting to be a teacher kind of earlier on when I was younger and then realising that I didn't want to work with children, um, that, that maybe was like, well, teaching adults is an option. 
Um, I do really have a passion for talking about things. And one of my favorite parts of the job in academia, which I guess is why I chose it, was when you're speaking to somebody and you see them get it, that's really special for me. Supervising students is like one of my favorite parts of the job on their final year um, projects. And seeing you've explained something to someone and they've said, no, I just don't get it. And you broke it down and you've maybe said, go away, look at this, look at that. And again, coming back to the TikTok things, trying to make it a different way of embedding the information can sometimes just make someone go, oh, didn't get it when you were literally sat there saying it over and over, but I've just seen one thing and it's just, I feel like now I could get it, I could break it down. And I think the reason for me that I wanted to go into academia was that there's so much variety and I guess there's a lot of a lot of freedom for me at the minute, especially working at Leeds Trinity. It's been really great for me to start my career there as an academic with my first role as a, as a lecturer at Leeds Trinity and have the freedom to be open with my ideas. I recently created an interactive um, session that I got a budget for. So I filmed some content with an actor where I was being, um, me as my role as a, a mental health care assistant that obviously I've done, and they were being a service user. And we had a, a little script, we wanted to keep it quite natural. Um, and we did some scenarios that obviously were not good practice. And then we did some scenarios that were good practice. And having that opportunity for me to create that content on campus in the facilities we have, and then to show the students and get them to work through a workbook and go through and say, what was good about this? What was not so good? What could we improve on? And they won't necessarily have that experience. So when they go into those roles, they'll be better equipped to it. They can reflect on it. And it really bridges that gap for them, not just me standing there and talking as an academic, which I can do but it's not going to give them that, that experience I've had. And it's not gonna prepare them for the first role that they will have, which isn't gonna be as a psychologist, it's probably going to be as a healthcare assistant or a support worker. So having that freedom to be flexible, to work with the students, but also share my knowledge that I've already gained through the eight years of experience working in low secure services. That was why I wanted to go into academia and also to continue my research at the moment. Um, but I do really enjoy working with service users in low secure units, and I do still do that from time to time at a weekend just to, to keep my clinical skills, if you will, um, and to keep that interaction going with the people I work with. So I would never say never to it, but I really enjoy academia at the minute and the, the kind of level, the balance, if you will, between research, working with other academics, and then being able to relate my experience in for the students. It's funny because so whilst you were talking about, um, you know, really sitting there and listening to somebody that just suddenly gets to it, I was thinking that is totally the experience I have at times with people in therapy or perhaps when you're working in rehabilitative services or even in the community more recently. A moment, you know, always, and Jerry, we've talked about that before, that moment where sort of something drops to somebody and whether that's something about their life or what's happened to them or how they've been harmful to others. Or as you say, in academia, when someone's like, oh, I actually get what you mean by a particular model or a particular theory. It's, I think that is probably a key part of wanting to be a psychologist. Yeah, and I think it's important to show the students that it's not, it's not just one role and there are different options. Like, I think a lot of students, when they come into, you know, first year psychology or forensic psychology, um, they don't really understand that you don't just get the degree and then get the job there's quite a lot to it but that depends which area you want to go into and that's something I'm always really honest with my students about um, especially because I lead the final year level six which is applied forensic psychology and we do several career sessions where we'll say like what careers could you have and they'll kind of they'll look at me a bit like I don't know that's for you to tell me and I think well what why are you here what do you want to do because there must be a reason that you're here do you all want to be forensic psychologists and about half of them are like, oh, I don't really know what that is. Um, and then breaking down those roles and kind of saying to them, these are the different options. This is what you need to do. It, it won't be for everybody. Not everybody who does a psychology degree will end up in psychology. But hopefully if they've had those sessions, especially the, the interactive ones I'm trying to get going with the students, those skills are transferable. Having people skills, having the desire to help someone, being able to see conflict resolution, that's a skill that you can use in your daily life, regardless of what job you have. And it's always good to learn kindness, to learn compassion, to learn understanding. 
obviously specifically if you're going into things like forensic psychology or psychology or therapy like you just said Laura but it's always good to learn not learn how to be kind but hopefully students can learn that as well but learn the compassion learn the connection learn that you sit in this room learning about psychology the service users that you work with will not come from the same background as you. You can't sit there and go, someone tells you that they're having a really bad time and what they've been through and their adverse child experience, their trauma. And you go, oh, I understand you don't. You should not say to somebody that you understand because you do not understand what has got someone there. You can empathize and you should empathize with them, but you should be able to have that level of, I don't understand that experience that you've had because it is it's so horrible, but I am here to listen to you and I'm here to, to support you with however however I can, basically, if that makes sense. Mm. And what was your um, thesis about for your research? So for my PhD, uh, my thesis was looking at public perceptions of individuals with mental illness who offend. And that included um, three empirical studies and then a rapid evidence assessment as well. The rapid evidence assessment was for me to kind of gauge the scope of the problem um, because it's quite evident that there is a problem, there is a stigma, both towards people who have mental health diagnoses and people who commit offences. And then there's this idea of this double or overlapping stigma where if somebody has committed an offence and they have a mental illness, it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So to give an example of how this ties into my research, which looks at the perceptions of schizophrenia particularly, because that's... Um, receives particularly heavy or negative stigma compared to other mental health conditions. Someone who has schizophrenia, for example, the myth would be that they would be dangerous, violent, you know, can't be trusted, shouldn't be allowed out in society, for example. If somebody with schizophrenia then commits a criminal offence, they've confirmed that bias that I already have about them, that they are dangerous, therefore they are definitely dangerous. Somebody who is offended and has schizophrenia cannot be rehabilitated. So, you know, we need to isolate them. We need to remove these people from society. And this ties into the idea of the desire for social distance. That's kind of just one, one small um, aspect of my research. I also wanted to look at um, the labeling of people with different diagnoses, different offense types. So whether you commit a violent versus a non-violent offense, um, if that fills into people's stereotypes. Also looking at different attributes of the perceiver, so the participants in the study, I mainly looked at um, gender identity differences with that, age differences, educational background, level of contact, so if somebody had personally experienced um, mental health themselves, or if they have worked with service users or have a friend or family member that has mental health issues, how that can relate to their stigma and their attitudes and also right-wing views and empathy as other constructs as well. It's a really interesting area. And I think even when we were setting up this channel, we were aware of perhaps how people might be left feeling when we try to think about, you know, if somebody, there's, I suppose there's people out there that are victims mm -hmm. um, and would think, well, someone deserves a label or someone deserves that sort of almost judgment from others. And then, you know, I suppose there's a whole wealth of research that looks at well you know if we want people to be different and change we can't keep calling them these same things that we really don't want them to be mm -hmm. but it's a it's a big cultural shift I think in the criminal justice and um, what have been your barriers how have people received um your research or what did you find out that's a really good question Laura and I get that on I get this mainly on social media as well um obviously with my students it's not just that they come in and they go, right, you're never allowed to say the word offender again. You're never allowed to say it because, you know, it is people do still use that terminology. Even other colleagues still use that terminology, mm -hmm. but I would not use that terminology. So somebody with an offending history, someone with a history of sexual offending, for example, instead of sex offender, it will take time to change the language, as you've just said. But if we can model that behavior and we change our language, hopefully the next generation of psychologists, of students, change their language and it will gradually sift out it's not going to change overnight we don't expect it to but to flip it on what you said about the victim so that's the main question that I get um, when I talk about my research or I talk particularly about person first labeling in terms of offense history and just to mention obviously if anyone's watching this um, when we talk about person first language in terms of offending, we're saying a person with a history of sexual offending rather than sex offender. I know that person first language isn't used in other fields such as autism, 
rather than person with autism, people prefer to be referred to as autistic. I'm not talking about that side of person first language now, I'm talking more in the terms of forensic psychology and offence-based labelling, so just obviously I'm aware of that. But I get a lot of people asking me like, why should we say that they have a history of sexual offending? They're a sex offender, they're a rapist, they've done these things, they get this label. And it is very difficult. I have been a, a victim of, of sexual assault in the past, and it wouldn't take away from my experience to call somebody else um, a person first label, but I appreciate that not everybody will share the same experiences I have. Some people will say that, you know, that's really, it's not on for people to change this label. They've done it, they deserve it. And, you know, I'm not here to, to change those people's views. I'm not here to tell them that they're wrong. But like you've just said, the research indicates that if you continue to call people by a label, they will act in the way that the label assigns them. And it is much more beneficial to refer to somebody as a person with an offending history rather than an offender. It helps with, and in terms of my research as well, it helps in terms of getting them jobs, being able to access um, things more readily, being able for them to accept what they've done and to move forward as a person rather than as an offender. So if it helps a little bit to reduce recidivism, to reduce the likelihood um, of them being coming involved in the criminal justice system again and offending in the future, is it not worth having those person first labels if it's going to help to reduce it by even a certain amount? It doesn't diminish the experience that the victims have had. So why, why would we not try and use that language, if that makes sense? Yeah, you put that really well. That's something we've spoken quite regularly about. And it is interesting that the people who have autism do prefer being referred to as autistic generally. I mean, that's a generalisation, but generally that's what people say. Um, so it's interesting to know why that is from them. It will be interesting to know that. But yeah, certainly something that's come up from um, lots of things I've read. Is the real question about when when is it a label or when is it about your identity? Like if you identify with something, we had this question before about um, when we were working in prisons, you know, what do you want to be called? And um, we had this whole discussion about service user and someone said, no, it makes me sound, you know, I don't want to be a user. I'm not someone that uses. I'm like, that's fine. What would you write? And I suppose it is about being really curious about, you know, what do people want to be referred as? Maybe someone with autism wouldn't want to be referred like that. And it is just, as you say, Jerry, always checking out what is what does that person need or want? And, and are we feeding into labels or is it about somebody's identity? We talk a lot about diagnosis in my work, you know, and one of the questions we always come across is like, you know, how do you find your diagnosis? Is it, has it been helpful? Has it not? And it really varies. People might say, actually, it really helped me to think about what was going on. And other people said, no, I felt really, really labelled by it. Labels are also important for context, aren't they? You wouldn't, I wouldn't just walk into a shop and tell people what my health issues are. They, they don't need to know it, but I would walk into a doctor's surgery and tell my doctor what those labels were. Or if I was in pain, I would tell my colleagues about it. So I think it's about people being comfortable enough to share it, but also knowing that if they do share it, they're not going to be faced with a level of stigma um, that's attached to it. And I think the you know, mental health stigma has significantly reduced, especially over kind of the last few years, in terms of all the campaigns, you know, get Britain talking on ITV, but we've still got a heavy stigma towards those severe mental illnesses, schizophrenia and um, personality disorder, things like that. And especially when we tie it into an offending history, because do these conditions make somebody offend or are offenders more likely to have these conditions? And neither of those are really true. Mm -hmm. So let's unpack it a little bit further and let's ask those questions. And also the media, which I'm sure we don't have time to start on my rant about the media and the way that they label people today, but be careful about what you read. If there's somebody listening to this today who's saying, who's thinking, oh, I read this, so this must be true. Please engage with, with me. Please ask people about it rather than reading an article and resharing that article on social media without actually thinking about if it's true or if it's accurate. Um, so I'm not expecting everyone to become a researcher after listening to this, <laughs> this podcast, um, but do keep an open mind. I always, I always tell people um, when I'm signing off from my live videos as well to keep an open mind, be kind to people and remember that there's more than one label that somebody could have um, you know, if somebody is labelled with offender, they might also be labelled with abuse victim. So don't just think about the one label that that, that person has. 
um, and remember to just be open-minded about the, the whole process of recovery as well. Mm. What, what's been the, what, what did you hope for your research in terms of impact? What is it that you would want your PhD to really have influence over? Um, I think the, the first part of it for me, um, so the first study was to establish a valid scale that could measure perceptions because there's a few of them out there and obviously as researchers it's important to make sure we're, we're accurately measuring a construct and we understand um, stigma and we understand attitudes. So the first part of that was the development of the scale um, that I then used in the, the subsequent the two piece of research after that. Um, the biggest part for me, which is the part that's not published yet, but the final part of it was looking at the interaction between people's level of contact with individuals who have mental illness and offend, um, their empathy and right-wing views, because they are things to an extent that we can change. And the highest predictor of um, attitude of negative attitudes was right-wing views. And I feel like this is particularly prevalent given the current world situation and politics becoming a lot more relevant again, especially to young people. And it's really important, don't wanna go on a political tangent today, but it's really important that people understand the impact that policies, that politics, that government have. And this is kind of why I wanted to measure right-wing views as well, because if we have um, a leader, I'm not talking about anyone specific, if we have a leader in charge who is particularly right-wing, who endorses um, the traditional right-wing traditional values, for example, this can impact mental health policies, it can impact funding, it can impact the NHS, it can impact a lot of other things. So from my research perspective, what I want to, to delve into a little bit more is the impact that this has on policies and agendas, uh, if that makes sense, because it might seem, it might not seem like a big deal, but if people endorse more right-wing views, they might be less likely to be inclusive of people with mental health issues coming in and accessing community support, which was one of my findings. And that is massive. We know that that's massive for the rehabilitation process. It's massive for reducing reoffending in the future, for poverty, for access to jobs. That's just four things really, that that's a really big issue that can impact somebody trying to seek that support whether they're seeking it out initially or whether they're trying to seek it out after an offence and they can't get access to it because the services aren't there and the services aren't there because the people in charge aren't putting money into that, into funding. So I think it's about that particular finding ties into where resources go, mm -hmm. um, which I wasn't really expecting it to be that intense. But that was the, the biggest finding that I want to look into a little bit more because we know that money's a big thing. We know that mental health services are struggling we know therapy struggling. We know there isn't enough psychologists. So if it can provide evidence for why we need this, hopefully that finding can give people a little bit more evidence. Just that's mm. obviously just one of them, but hopefully that answers the, the question about one of the big impacts that, that mm. I think it has. Mm. And also accommodation, also that's a really important issue. And I think lots of people um, can't believe that a person can be released from prison and have nowhere to go and live. Mm. Um, and yet then they don't in some ways then think, well, why should they be given accommodation over somebody in the community who hasn't got accommodation? But then, you know, knowing that somebody has got nowhere to live and hasn't got employment is going to increase their chances of them trying to support themselves in a way that they're familiar with. So it is all of those things. And, and as you say, the political party in at the time will think, you know, we're going to be tough on crime, for instance, or, you know, whatever the slogan might be is popular at that time um, makes a big difference so I think you can't help but be political in some ways although that might not be something you, you feel you're interested in um, you sort of get drawn into it because of the lack of um, money going into services that's desperately needed yeah absolutely so what are your future plans and what do you want to do now you're still young you're just getting your PhD what, will you, what are you going to do next I don't want to get too ahead of myself because I want to enjoy this time. Um, like I said before about the, you know, the freedom that I have to create the content um, that I'm doing at the moment um, and all these ideas, because I'm not sure where my creat creativity will dry up. Um, so try to get all my energy out at the minute. But for me, um, I'm currently leading on level six applied forensic psychology. I've done that for the last year. Um, and if many of my students are watching, I appreciate you nominating me for the innovative teaching um, award this year. Um, do more of that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to do more of that, really, um, to because I did that as like a tester. 
I got 100% positive feedback from my students, a couple of areas for, for development that I'm always happy to learn from my students. So develop more content now, really, um, now that I've got all the core content that I wanted to do for my module, um, develop that a little bit more. I'm also working with a few colleagues to develop an MSc um, in Forensic Psychology at Leeds Trinity, so I'm working on that. Um, I got my um, fellow in higher education last year, so I'd like to get my senior fellow later this year. Um, but yeah, just really enjoy um, the process of learning how to teach. Um, hopefully I'm, I'm doing well and my students think I'm doing well, but you can always learn. There's always new ways to engage the students. Um, like I said, I want to learn from the students more. I want to be a better supervisor for my students. So at the minute, I'm just really enjoying um, the process and learning more from them. And hopefully in the future, um, obviously becoming a senior lecturer. And then we'll just, we'll, we'll see what happens from there really. But yeah, I'm just enjoying the, the whole process, to be honest, um, and trying to get through the marking. If we're talking about short-term goals, try to get through the marking in the next few months. And then I can focus on my content and redeveloping the content and getting some more um, up-to-date content for the next academic year as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Sounds really exciting. Yeah. And it sounds like you're always uh, up ahead of the curve as well of what's what's becoming current, which is really important to know that, isn't it? And be willing to take a risk and to do those things. Um, it's so important. We really interact with people where they are. Yeah, and I think it's good. It's good to try some things because I think people think, well, something that I read recently, for example, is you can only be embarrassed if you let yourself be embarrassed. And I thought that's really interesting because yeah, I put myself out there developing the interactive content. Um, I do have an A-level in drama and theater studies, but I'm no actor. I was, I was just being myself in those situations to try and give the students a perspective that they hadn't maybe seen before and they wouldn't be able to see unless they got into that job. Um, because it won't be for everyone. We know forensic psychology won't be for everyone, but it's important to, to give people helpful tasters and ease them in. Um, we don't want to throw anyone in at the deep end with a really serious confrontation and, and have people triggered um, and upset anyone. We definitely don't want to do that. But it, there will be difficult situations with the service users and the client group that we work with. So I reflected on that and I thought, yeah, do you know what? If, if, I'm, if I'm doing something, I need to be willing to learn. I need to be willing to, to make myself vulnerable. And, you know, if it doesn't go as well, then we learn from it, we move on. At the end of the day, the students will have a laugh. And in a few years, will they really remember that? I mean, they might, I don't know. Um, but you've got to laugh at yourself as well and learn through the process. And I feel like having that element of vulnerability helps the students to relate to you and see that I'm not just someone who's done an undergraduate degree, a master's, a PhD, and I'm stood here just teaching them content that I've read. I've lived this, I've worked with the client group, and um, I've come through my own adversity and from a working class background, like I've said before. So it's about showing them that there is, they have the potential and they can do it if they're from a different background. They can work with these people. They, if they don't want to work with this client group, what the other options are. So I think being vulnerable is a, a, a real skill to, to allow yourself to have that um, and come out of the other side. I don't, it's, you know, it's a cliche, come out stronger, isn't it? Sometimes you don't come out stronger. I'm going to be honest, there's things that have been really difficult for me where I felt, uh, you know, really broken after it. And it's not easy. It's not an easy career. Imposter syndrome is really rife. Um, you know, you two are both nodding as well and you're a lot further into careers than I am. And it just is, there'll always be those elements of doubt, but it's okay. And I think if anyone's watching this thinking like, oh, I really want to get to the point where I'm confident like you and I can stand up and I don't have any doubts. <laughs> I have doubts every single day. Yeah, like, like that. <laughs> you know, yeah. when I've edited a video and I think, oh, is it good enough? Or I'm stood giving a lecture and I'm halfway through and a student asks me a question. And I think, am I qualified to give this answer? Mm -hmm. Or like, mm -hmm. it's about my actual research that I've put four years of my life into. Mm -hmm. And I think, does, does a certain red top newspaper know more than I do? Probably not. Um, <laughs> doubt it. But the doubt will always be there, but it's about how you deal with that. And it's about saying, I, I do doubt myself, but I know I can do this. And also it's about saying, if I don't know this answer, don't pretend that you know the answer. Mm -hmm. Go to somebody else, work with colleagues, 
people that work with you are your allies connect with people in a wider community watch other podcasts that you guys have done and learn from different practitioners and different academics in the field because you don't just need you don't need to be like me you need to be your own version of yourself if this can inspire you that's brilliant but you need to be the best version of yourself and give those qualities that you can give to the world um, and enhance enhance that because that's what's going to make you a good practitioner or a good listener to somebody who's never had anyone ask them a question about how do you feel before and actually care about the answer and um, so care about people be kind to people and like I said before just have an open mind to new experiences really you say all the time I was, I was laughing and nodding because also there's times when you know many times actually when I've been sat with somebody or in a group with somebody or whatever and I've gone oh I didn't get that right did I <laughs> and they've gone no and you're like okay go on tell me again you know and, and and it's been such a good way to just be normal mm. and be a human and appreciate that everybody else you're working with are just humans mm. it's, it's been probably the thing that has kept me in this work for so long and, and it is with you as Jerry we've had so many conversations mm. about that that we just sort of say to them oh I'm sorry that was really mm. I did that really badly or I or I said that really inappropriately or I got that wrong it's warmed situations mm. that have been really high tempered at times and you think mm. oh or, or do you know what I just being able to say sorry yeah oh, sorry I got that wrong that's whether we're working with students yeah. or people mm. yeah. and saying you don't know I mean I think that's so important because none of us yeah. know everything and as people have asked me questions and I sort of look around to think who are they asking <laughs> why, are they, why are you asking me that I mean the, the thing at Covid was sort of the big thing when we with people well what you know how, how should we react or like I don't know, don't know. <laughs> how would we know we've never been through it either but there was this sort of perception that we just know everything and it's it was really funny to be able to just say I had no idea I don't know how to react I'm trying to make sense of it myself but yeah, yeah that ha happens I think well, what made you ask me what made you think I'd know the answer yeah. to that question but I think imposter syndrome is a big um we'll have to do an episode on that because yeah well, I think we should that lives with you I think throughout <laughs> your career but I wouldn't want to think oh I know everything and everybody can just ask me anything because how would I answer the questions when I don't <laughs> so I think it is really important that we we're, we're honest about that and I always tell the students like I, I don't know everything um, I don't know if you think I do, but I definitely don't. Um, you know, I've been on this planet 28 years. I don't know everything. But if you ask me a specific question about something that I have intensely researched and I know about this, mm. I, I'll know a lot. I still won't know everything, but you will never know anything. And some, mm -hmm. you know, someone who had supervised me and mentored me before once said to me when I was I was struggling with imposter syndrome and I was having a really difficult week and I was I was halfway through my PhD. And they just sat down, they said, just stop a minute, Sam you want to know everything don't you and I was like yeah who doesn't want to know who doesn't want to know everything like I'm passionate about this and they said you can be passionate and also accept that you won't know everything about this and I was like oh I'm not sure no not sure about that that doesn't sound like the thing for me like I want to know everything um, and they got a piece of paper and they said right this piece of paper is like all the knowledge in the entire world this is like if you could know everything like no one knows everything this is everything and I was like okay um, and then they drew like a circle on it and they were like, this is what we know about the world because like, you know, not everyone knows everything. So this is what humans as a, as a race know about everything. And then like another circle inside, I thought this is making me uncomfortable now, but it was a good, it was a good process, a circle in the middle. And it said like, this is what psychologists know about the world. And another circle, and it said, this is what forensic psychologists know. And then like some circles that overlapped. And then it really annoyed me. And this person drew like a really small dot right in the middle of this and said, that's what you know. And I was like, oh. and that kind of hurt for a second. But then I thought, yeah, do you know what? And then we drew some more circles and said, like, this is what you know. And this is what somebody else knows. And, and that's why it's important to speak, because you can then learn from other people and everyone will have their circles all overlapping and interchanging because you will never have all of those experiences. You will never have all of that knowledge. But the more that you speak, the more that you're willing to learn things and not just, oh, I've got to this point. So, you know, I've got my PhD, so I don't need to learn anymore. That's the danger. And that's the only, I think that's the only time that I would be disappointed in myself if I ever stopped being passionate about it or ever stopped wanting to learn or stopped wanting to be creative and innovative that's when I'd be disappointed in myself. And as long as I can always say that I'd be open to learn from anyone, whether that be students, colleagues, practitioners, service users, 
as long as I can say that, then I can wake up and say that I'm happy with myself and I'm proud of the, the journey that I'm going on um, wherever that would lead me in forensic psychology. Oh, that's fascinating. Thanks ever so much, Sam. It's been really lovely <laughs> to talk to you. And um, it's been really interesting to, to, to learn about your research. Um, and it just remains for us to say, let's talk forensic psychology. Mm -hmm.